Uh, maybe if you hadn't thought through uh, uh, too much, uh, maybe some people didn't even realize that John the Baptist was in prison and that he died uh, by execution while he was, he was in prison long before or shortly before uh, Jesus himself uh, died on the cross. And so I thought we'd continue our study uh, in the uh, study of John the Baptist just to pick up on, on that idea before uh, we moved on. I think uh, perhaps the Lord will lead us into a, uh, a study on Sunday morning for uh, the next uh, few weeks at least. Anyways, on Bible characters, uh, I'm thinking about that. But certainly we want to look at John the Baptist. We saw him last week as the most humble man. Now we want to see him as the most persecuted uh, man. You know, we live in a time, uh, I've I never seen a time like we live in, that, that everybody's feelings seem to be hurt about something or other. Uh, and uh, I don't know what, what exactly the problem is when you expand your mind and heart a little bit, like Brother Al was saying, when you see people uh, enslaved uh, in other countries without hope, uh, what little trivial thing that somebody can say about you to hurt your feelings and make you run to a safe space, uh, you know, seems a, a very, very little. Now, I'm not putting down safe places. Uh, the Bible says that, uh, that God is our shelter uh, in times of trouble. And so we have a safe place, uh, too, but it's a real place. It's not just uh, some time out place. But the fact of the matter is, is that problems follow us uh, even as Christians, problems follow us. And so don't get discouraged about that. Uh, and don't get discouraged during times of mistreatment. Because uh, as we'll see in our study this morning, if somebody ever told you that you had not to be mistreated, uh, they, they've, been, they've been telling you something that, that's not true. Uh, as we read in Matthew chapter 5 this morning, uh, the, the idea, of course, is, is that, that troubles come. Mistreatment happens. Persecutions uh, are, are real. Uh, and the question is, how do we handle those things? Uh, you know, God is more concerned uh, about your response uh, to mistreatment uh, than he is the mistreatment itself that you may be suffering. So I hope to give us some practical insights in, a, in a, just a short time uh, we, we have together this morning that will that help us to, to take courage and to be built up and, and to have some ammunition in our lives and hearts as we move forward uh, to face the problems and tribulations and persecutions uh, and mistreatment that we might see. Uh, the author Scott Peck, who wrote a book, The Road Less Traveled, said this, Confronting and solving problems is painful, yet... It is the process of meeting, it is the process of meeting and solving problems that life has its meanings. Problems are the cutting edge that distinguishes between success and failure. Problems call forth our courage and our wisdom. Indeed, they create our courage and our wisdom. It is only because of problems that we grow mentally and spiritually. And so the psalmist cried out, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Praise the Lord. Look in your Bibles at, uh, for Mark uh, chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, and find verse 17. And having found that, uh, if you would stand out of reverence for God's Word, I want to read just a few verses of, uh, we'll look at several more verses, but just uh, let's look at just... Uh, the verse, first three verses, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into our study this morning. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, that's his wife, his brother, uh, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. Father, we pray for that blessing. 
And God, we ask that we would take uh, from the story of John uh, precepts and principles that, that we could practice our own selves, that in times of troubles and problems and mistreatments, uh, God, that uh, we might uh, have a clear understanding uh, of the world around us and the world above us. Uh, God, we pray that you would bless each person uh, to that end this morning. And Lord, we uh, pray especially for that one that desires to be saved today, that this would be that day uh, that they come into your kingdom. For others that are walking at a distance from thee, I pray for their repentance and their return. And uh, God, that uh, you would direct us as a church, uh, that we may be ever looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, let's look first at the reality of mistreatment. Biblical predictions abound regarding the mistreatment that you and I are going to suffer. Many of those things we suffer simply and only because we're a Christian. So again, I tell you, if somebody told you that becoming a Christian is the way out of problems, uh, no, it's the way into a whole new set of problems that, that you wouldn't have had if you hadn't have been uh, saved. <clears throat> but salvation saves you from that one problem that would be devastating in your life, and that is to die and go to hell for all eternity. It's not the end of all your problems, but it's the end of the biggest problem that you ever had. Uh, Jesus already suffered uh, the, 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 the result of that for us. And so the Bible says, for example, in 2 Timothy, Yea, and all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All, right? all and shall. All right? That includes everybody in this room. If you're living godly. Now let me say this. To the, to the degree that the world pats you on the head and rubs your back and tells you that you're a wonderful Christian, to that same degree, you are not like your Savior, Jesus Christ, who never had his head patted and his back rubbed and told how wonderful that he was by the world. Don't be like the man that got a job, the Christian man that got his job, and he told his wife over breakfast, he said, I'm really worried, honey. Uh, I got this new job, and you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian man, and, and uh, you know, I don't know my colleagues, and, and uh, you know, honey, pray for me as I go to work today. <clears throat> oh, dear, I, I certainly will. And so he goes to work, he comes back, he's sitting at, now at the supper table, and his wife goes, well, how did it go today, dear? He said, oh, Praise the Lord, it went wonderful. I was there all day and not one person found out I was a Christian. Now there's how you, that's how you get away from mistreatment. You know, just become an undercover agent for the Lord, you see. But all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus did that and Jesus says to us in John 15, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Well, there's also a biblical reaction to mistreatments that we need to understand. And that is this. First of all, we must keep a biblical perspective about what's happening to us. All right? <clears throat> the Bible says, let us go forth bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city but we seek one to come. This world is not our home. All right? This is the problem that we have. We want, to, we want to be accepted back into the world that we rejected when we received Christ, and it can't be done. It can't be done. You see? Uh, there are some people uh, that, uh, for some reason or other, give up their American citizenship uh, and um, apply for citizenship someplace else because they think it's going to be better or there's whatever reason they might have. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was one of those guys. You remember that name. Uh, and he worked and worked and worked and tried to get his U.S. passport back, and the U.S. told him, you had your chance. You're not coming, You're not coming back again. Uh, it, it's the same way for a Christian. Uh, <clears throat> the Bible says our... Save people. Our citizenship is now in heaven. That's 
All right? From whence we look for the Savior to come. He's our blessed hope. Now tonight, you come back tonight, we're going we're to start uh, a series uh, tonight on things that will shock the world. Absolute true things. All right? Now you can watch TV shows that talk about the unbelievable or the whatever uh, it might be, but you come back tonight and we're going to talk about things that are beyond believable but are absolutely true <clears throat> and tonight we're going to talk about the rapture of the church because that's the first thing that's going to blow the the heads off of unsaved people uh, when we disappear now it doesn't matter if there's thousands and tens of thousands of christians so-called christians that, that do not believe that there is going to be a rapture it, it doesn't matter what you believe right. it, it's just going to happen some of us, the Bible says, will be ashamed at his coming, and some of us will have confidence at his coming. And so all those born-again people that didn't believe he was going to come, when he comes, uh, they're going to be shocked. All right? uh, and the unbelieving world around us is going to be shocked. Uh, but you and I are looking for that day. Well, I don't want to preach tonight's message uh, this morning, but the point I'm trying to, to make is, <clears throat> is that we need to bear the reproach of Christ in this world so that we can be honored by him in the next. The Apostle Paul sums it up this way. With me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you. He that judges me is the Lord. And that should be our attitude. All right? Yes, I'd like everybody to like me. But it's more important to me that my Savior can use me and be proud of me. And so it's a small thing to me when unbelievers say things about me. Right? Uh, because it's the Lord that's going to judge me. Is that your attitude, too, in the midst of mistreatment? If it's not, you're already losing the battle. Uh, Paul <clears throat> understood this. And so we, in times of mistreatment, must rely on the word of God. The psalmist says, Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. We need to go back to God's word in times of difficulty, and we must engage in prayer as well. I'm, I'm reading from James uh, chapter 1, at, beginning with verse 2. Brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, that is, various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, get this. If any of you lack wisdom regarding the circumstances that you're in, is that you this morning? If any of you lack wisdom regarding the trials and circumstances and problems that you may be encountering. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Pray. Pray. Let him ask of God. It goes on to say that, Give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Prayer and the word of God go together, and both of these help us to become patiently enduring patience endurance comes through the word of god and prayer are you about ready to throw your hands up and give up uh, this morning uh, have you lost your patient endurance my speculation is you've also set aside your bible and it's been a while since you read it and you've wrung your hands instead of putting your hands together uh, in prayer you've wrung your hands together in worry uh, and self-pity, uh, and that's why you find yourself in this situation. You've abandoned the Word of God and the opportunity to pray, 1 Peter 2.20. If when you do well and suffer for it, take it patiently, for this is acceptable with God. Well, that's easy for you to say, you see. Well, I didn't say it. Uh, the Bible said it. And Jesus is our example, as we'll see. And it wasn't easy for Jesus to say it. But he had, but he had to endure it. Uh, 
we see that in 1 Peter 2.23, speaking of Jesus, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, and that's what we should do too. Commend yourself to God. God, you judge me. If I was wrong in this, then you show it to me, and I'll make it right. But if I'm not in the wrong, then give me in patient endurance in the midst of this and, and, and allow me to suffer with the same patience that Jesus suffered the cross for me. Jesus' reaction to mistreatment, uh, the Bible says, leaves us an example. For even hitherto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. And so turn to the Lord Jesus in prayer, but turn to him also as an example of patient endurance. When, when you do right and suffer for it, then the Lord will be with you. That brings us to our response to mistreatment. If we follow Jesus' example, when we're mistreated by other people, we must not be intimidated. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that have had a similar experience to this when they talk to somebody. Well, you know, you really just need to put your faith in Christ. I don't want to hear that from you. Oh, did I offend you? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I don't want you to go to hell, that I want your life full and full of fruit, uh, that I said this to you. I'm so sorry that I said that. What's the word they use? Don't be a Karen. All right? Don't look for a safe space. Uh, don't be intimidated when you speak up for the Lord. Be like a John the Baptist. Don't be intimidated. Don't worry or become anxious when being mistreated and people don't like you. Oh, maybe I need to change. Maybe I need to gain weight. I need to lose weight. I need to grow five inches. I, you know, uh, what will it take to make other people like me? Hey, hey, hey. <clears throat> That's not the goal of your life, to make other people like you. Now, we would all like to be... Like, I want everybody to like me. But you know what? Not everybody's going to like me. Okay. It took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> but here I am to tell you that it only matters that Jesus likes us. You see? As long as we're doing what he wants us to do, we're fine. We're fine. Grow a little bit thicker skin on you, my Christian brother. My Christian sister, don't be intimidated. Don't worry. Don't become anxious. Don't blame others. Don't blame others. All right? I mean, always, always find a scapegoat, can't you? I mean, it's not my fault. It's, it's him. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's going to, you, you can, if you look hard enough, you can, you can chuck everything off your back and put it on someone else's. Don't blame others. And don't run and hide, and don't whine and complain, but be a Christian that has a backbone of steel. Stand for what's right in your life, and you'll be surprised who will stand with you. The Lord will stand with you, all right? and others will stand with you as well if you'll just grow a backbone. You don't, listen, just because you're Christian doesn't mean that you wear a kick-me sign on your back, you know? Uh, you, you, got, you, you got to have rock ribs and steel spines sometimes. John the Baptist had to do that as well, as we'll see. Jesus did it as well, as we saw. Don't be intimidated. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Don't blame others. Don't 
run and hide. Don't whine and complain when you're being mistreated, but rather be confident and fearless in the face of mistreatment. The Bible says, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. There's a privilege uh, to suffer with him. The Bible says, if, if we suffer with him, we'll reign with him. He left us behind with an example of himself and the things that he suffered for us. When you compare what you may be suffering for him, there's no comparison, is there? Uh, there, 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 there there's no equality in that. And so just take it like Jesus took it, silently. But sometimes we have to speak. And if you must speak, speak biblically with conviction. The Bible says, the Bible says, if you don't know the Bible, then you're not going to speak with conviction. John the Baptist knew the Bible, right? Because as we read in, in chapter 6 and verse 18, uh, he said to, to Herod the king, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Now, under Jewish law, this was a commandment, right? Uh, and, and, and John just quoted him the Bible. He said, you're not doing right. You're not doing right. Well, I'm so tired of you uh, Christians pointing out uh, all, all my mistakes. So you know their mistakes. All right. See, you're just told on yourself. All right. <clears throat> I hear that all the time. The Christians are always pointing out the mistakes of others. So, they are, so others are making mistakes. No, I didn't say that. That's exactly what you said. You see, listen, <clears throat> when the truth becomes your truth, then the wheels fall off of a society and all conversation stops. When everybody's right, nobody's right. All right? But I'll stick with the Bible Amen. that says, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen. That's what you got to stick with. Are you cut out for that? Well, you were saved for that purpose. And guess what? The Holy Spirit of God that indwells you to the day of redemption can give you the power and strength to take a stand like a John the Baptist and say, the Bible says, just stand with the Word of God. Well, that's your opinion. No, I just quoted you the Bible. Been around for a long time. I get my opinions from the Word of God. That's what you've got to go with. So if you must speak, speak biblically. And if you have to act, act with courage. Turn a few pages back to, to Matthew 11, if you want to, with me. Uh, <clears throat> and find a verse, well, let's see, Matthew 11, and find verse uh, 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, John the Baptist, what went you into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Right. Uh, then he goes on and asks another rhetorical question. But what you uh, went uh, out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are the, in the king's houses. He wore coarse clothing, didn't he? Uh, he wasn't a reed shaken in the wind. And look at verse 10, uh, <clears throat> verse 9. What went you out to see? A prophet? Yes, a prophet. And I say unto you, more than a prophet. And, and so if you're going to act with courage, all right, be like John the Baptist. Don't be a dropout. See, a, a reed shaken in the wind is not going to last very long. If the winds of convention or your family or your workplace or wherever it might be can knock you over, then you're going to lose every time. You're going to lose every time. Don't be a dropout. Well, I'm just through talking about it. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it anymore. 
Jesus, you understand. And he goes, I understand I went all the way to Calvary for you. I understand that. All right. Uh, listen, uh, Jesus is the wrong guy to go to when you want to quit. Amen. All right. Amen. Don't go to him because he's going to make you stay in the game because that's what he saved you for. He said, look, get you, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, get back in the game. And I will be with you, and I'll never forsake you. Let's go. Let's go. He says that to you this morning. Don't be a dropout. Don't be a sellout. Don't look for the world to give you soft clothing, you see. Uh, the idea is that it, it, Jesus said, when you went out to see John the Baptist, did you go out to see a sellout? Somebody that's already sold out to the conventions of the world? All right. No, there's rhetorical. No, of course you didn't go out for that. Not a dropout. Don't be a sellout. And, and, and don't be a cop out. Uh, be a prophet. That's what Jesus said. No, he wasn't a cop out. He spoke as of as the voice of God. All right. In the wilderness. All right. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. So don't drop out, no matter what your situation is, Christian. And don't sell out this morning. And don't cop out over it. But rather go all out and speak out for the glory of God. Even the least of us can do all of this through the power of God, based on verse 11, when we we're uh, back <coughs> where we were reading. For this is he of whom uh, it is written, uh, Behold, I send, uh, excuse me, uh, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there is not one risen greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. That's everybody in here and anybody in here. If you're born again, you're greater. You have greater power than John the Baptist. Because you've got this completed book. John only had half of this. He preached what he had, but he only had half of it. You've got the whole thing. I've got the whole thing. The least, most pathetic person that's in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Preacher, I can't do it. I can't take it anymore. Here's my counsel to you. Will you do it for one more day? Will you do it for one more day? Man, I can't tell you how many things I've gotten through by saying, all right, I'm going to do it for one more, one more time. Then I'm not going to do it no more. I'm through. I'll do it one more time, then I'm done. Well, I've gotten a, some of you have done the same thing, haven't you? All right. You got where you are today because you did one day at a time, and you did it one more day, and then the next day you went, well, okay, one more day, but really, one more day, that's it. And then the next day, and the next day, and the next day, all right? Uh, I would have never got my undergraduate degree if I didn't operate that. I would have dropped out a long time ago, all right? Probably should have and not paid my, my, uh, all my loans back. I guess I'm going to get a refund. I'll get a refund, so I'm, I'm encouraged about that. So, uh, but anyways, this is the idea. Now, all right, preacher, get to the point. All right, good. Give me something practical. Give me something I can chew on. Give me something I can leave here with this morning. All right, all right. fair enough. If I give you four or five things, uh, see if you can put them into practice in your life. I can't live them out for you, but God can if you'll give him permission. So let's take them one at a time. <clears throat> what kind of resolve must we leave here with this morning? Number one, resolve to consider the source when you're being mistreated, resolve to consider the source. What do I mean? I mean this. If someone who is living wrong does you wrong, expect it and forget it. All right. If somebody that's living wrong does you wrong, what did you expect? Expect it. And forget it. 
All right? Don't let him or her end your walk with the Lord. Romans 12, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If you can do it, then do it. All right? Live peaceably with all men. If, the, if, the, if, the, if they live wrong and they do you wrong, what else did you expect from them? All right? uh, don't be disappointed. Just forget it and move on. Now, second scenario. If someone who lives right does you wrong, church member or something like that, you know, if someone who lives right does you wrong, excuse it. And forgive it. Excuse it. And forgive it. As they drove the nails into his hand and feet, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were doing what they had done hundreds and hundreds of times before in these executions. They were professional executioners. They knew exactly what they was doing. What did Jesus mean by that? He meant that he did, they didn't understand the core truths of what was happening. And good people who treat you wrong deserve your forgiveness because they don't understand the magnitude of what they're doing, not just to you, but to the Savior who has saved you. Ephesians 4.32 Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, now get this, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Boy, there's the standard. Boy, that was so bad what they did, I just don't know if I could ever forgive them. Uh Uh-oh. See? And God goes, That's right. That's right. All right? All right? Oh, you're right, Father. Oh, Uh, You know, I don't have a leg to stand on when I think about what Jesus forgave me for, that I can't forgive somebody else uh, for that. Jesus told the parable about the the guy that uh, worked for a rich man. He was a steward, and he was embezzling. And uh, um, the master called him in and said, Man, you're you're done. You're done. You're a a thief. You're stealing money from me. Uh, I'm going to fire you. And so he immediately, the Bible said, went out to, with the collection book and started talking to all the people that owed the master money. And he said, look, you know, <clears throat> give, me, give me 10% of what you owe and I'll write the other 90% off. Give me 25% of what you owe, I'll write the other 75% off. He had to have a retirement fund, you know. He was already being fired. So he, took, he, he just skimmed a little bit more. Well, when the master heard that, boy, he was very, very upset, obviously, uh, uh, about that. And he, he told the man, he said, look, <clears throat> I had forgiven you all that you stole from me and fired you. And now you're stealing more from me. Now you're going to have to pay everything back. And so Jesus' point was this. How would you like to be put in a situation where you won't forgive, even though every Sunday we pray, Father, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You know, we pray that uh, together all, all, all the time. God is asking, how would you like me then to extract payment for every sin that you did? You know? The Bible says if we don't forgive others, we won't be forgiven ourselves. So this is an important truth that I'm trying to teach here Consider the source. If a right person does you wrong, excuse it and forgive it. In every case, know that God has allowed this to happen in your life for your good and His glory. Mark it down. You might not understand it, but God is a good God that does good things and something good is going to come out of it. Romans 8.28 Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers and endured tremendous hardships uh, and mistreatment. Uh, But finally, the brothers came to him, uh, and Joseph had the answer 
uh, to their problems. They didn't, they didn't know it was Joseph. But when Joseph revealed himself to them, the brothers were scared because they thought, now he'll kill us for what we did to him. And Joseph goes, I'm not going to kill you. And this is the reason why. Genesis 50 and verse 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. It may take time. It may take time, but I'm guaranteeing you, based on the word of God, that the situation that you find yourself in is going to turn out all right if you keep trusting and following God. If you walk away from Him now, you'll never find victory in your life. Don't leave the battlefield, but stay and fight and trust. Consider the source. Number two, <clears throat> resolve to focus on the truth. What you said or what you did, was it biblical? Now, if it wasn't, you owe an apology to somebody. But if it was biblical, then have confidence that you did the right thing. Right. Well, maybe I shouldn't have said what I said to him or, or her. Well, what did you say? Well, I, I just told him that, that Jesus loved him and Jesus will forgive him. And then they got all upset about me being a religious freak and a holy roller and, and everything is so... Well, is that not true, what you told him? Well, yes, it's absolutely true. Then have some confidence. Grow a backbone. Have some confidence that you spoke up using the Word of God. And quit being a whiner. All right? Take a stand on the Word of God. Okay? The B-I-B-L-E we sang as children. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Were you acting or speaking with the right motivation? You see, because sometimes the Bible says that we need to speak the truth in love. Sometimes you can use truth as a weapon. All right? Uh, it is true that lost people go to hell. But there's a way to tell it to lost people that will draw them to the Savior and not drive them deeper back into their depression and sin. Was your motivation right? Well, if it was, then be comforted in the fact that you did the right thing and said the right thing. Uh, you're not perfect, and you're not the wisest. Uh, you're not God, uh, but you did what you could, and so just be confident in that. Quit wringing your hands over telling somebody the truth in the right way. Was your motivation right? Yes. Was the words that you say biblical? Yes. Well, then <clears throat> give it up to the Lord. Remember Matthew 5, 9, we read this morning. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, there, not all peacemakers make peace, but all peacemakers try to make peace. And so, if something's happened to you, 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 you simply need to get over it. If you don't get over it, you never get past it. And, and if you can't get past it, you can't go on with it. See? You, you're going to be stopped right where you are. So get over it, right? So you can get past it. So you can get on with it. The Word of God is the key, because the Word of God is the truth of God. Jesus said, thy word is truth. God will never forsake his truth because, as he told Jeremiah, I'm watching over my word to perform it. And God will never abandon his truthful children. I have no greater joy, the Apostle John said, than to hear that my children walk in truth. Live the truth, believe the truth, walk in the truth, follow the truth, Resolve to be truthful. Number three, resolve to watch your attitude. All right, consider the source, focus on the truth, and resolve to watch your attitude. See, when you're hurt, and uh, when, you're, when you've been hurt, it's easy to surrender to the feelings of self pity and, and bitterness and resentment towards others or towards God. 
I mean, this is easy when you're hurt to, to sit back and lick your wounds. Uh, don't do that. Don't give in to that. Resolve to watch your attitude. Uh, there's also a temptation to, to fix blame on the other person. Well, it's not me, it's him. It's not me, it's her. It's not me, it's them. Don't fix the blame on the other person. Don't panic and abandon biblical principles. It's time to stick even closer to the Bible, if that was possible, and not walk away from it. <clears throat> and don't seek revenge. And, and, by the way, spoiler alert, revenge all, often looks like righteous indignation. Right? So I smote them for the Lord. Boy, I... I put her in her place for Jesus' sake. <laughs> it sounds terrible when your preacher says it out loud, doesn't it? But you see, that's what righteous indignation happens. Hey, look, it's okay to be mad at the things God's mad at, but God's not mad at people. All right? uh, the idea is, 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 is check your attitude. Check your attitude in the midst of, of all this. A sinful attitude is a response to mistreatment, all right? A sinful attitude in response to mistreatment will give birth to a sinful response. So watch your attitude. Don't fall into that. Don't let the hurt overcome you, but allow God, now get this, to overcome the hurt for you. Don't let the hurt overcome you, but allow God to overcome the hurt for you. Ask him to pull you tight and hold you close and be your comfort and be your support. That's what you need to keep your attitude straight. If you don't, your attitude is going to sour and things are going to downhill from there. Accept mistreatment as Jesus accepted the cross and as John accepted his prison cell. Remember, mistreatment for Christ's sake is to be expected and must be responded to biblically or you become the loser. While John, you see, like John, we continue to serve God in the midst of our mistreatment. Mistreatment doesn't stop us from living the Christian life. It's part of the Christian life. Years ago, Right after the revolution in Romania, uh, when they ousted the communist uh, dictator Ceausescu, uh, 1990, or uh, well, even before uh, that, I think it was before that, the, the Romanian, when I was there uh, in the 80s, the Romanian church, uh, they really took solace. It was a terrible time, by the way, a terrible situation, in their heroes. Uh, those that had suffered for Christ uh, as an example. And they told me the story, and I have no reason to believe that it wasn't true. They told me the story of a man, pa a pastor, that was arrested uh, for preaching the gospel and thrown into a notorious prison. Uh, and the people loved their pastor. Uh, and they prayed for him. And, and they, they collected money to pay a bribe, because that's how things worked in the communist era and beyond to pay a bribe to get them out. And they talked to enough people and they collected enough money and they, they greased enough palms to get the guy out. And so they were all there outside that prison gate waiting for him and the gate opened, the door opened and he comes out just a little ways and they cheered and cried and hugged his neck and he told them, listen, I've got to go back. There's people inside the prison that need to hear the gospel. I've got hundreds of people waiting for me to come back and preach and explain the gospel to them. And that preacher turned around and went back into that prison instead of coming out to a church that loved him and, and needed him as well. He had realized this is where God would have me to be. Hey, why do I tell you that story? Because God has you right where he wants you to be. All right? Be that person that God saved you to be in the midst of your situation. Watch your attitude about the whole thing. Listen, you're not the center of the universe. Jesus Christ is the center of your universe. Well, let me move on to a fourth one. Resolve to continue 
fellowship. In other words, stay in touch with objective, spiritually minded people. Right? Uh, uh, Matthew, the first part, you don't have to turn there, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 11, but I'm going to go up to the top. Now when John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that shouldeth come, or do we look for another? John was in prison. John was doubting. We talked about this last week. Uh, But he stayed in touch with other believers, chapter 2. And when he had a question, he went to the only person that could answer it, and that was Jesus himself. And so if you learn nothing else, understand this. In the midst of your heartbreak and hurt, you need to be in church. Well, Pastor, when I get all this straightened out, when my heartbreak is over, and I think I can take it, I'll come back. No, 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 no. You need to come back today. Listen, that's like telling, listen, when I get feeling better, I'm, 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 I'm sick. And I get feeling better, I'm going to go to the hospital. Uh, have, them, have them polish it off for me, you know. And, uh, you know, that's crazy, you know. Well, it's just as crazy spiritually to say, I, 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 just, can't, I just can't go back. I've I got to stay out. And when, when I get everything, all, everything answered and everything straightened out, I'll be back. In church, okay, all right, fine. You see, the church is, it's like a triage station. It's like a hospital. that We're here to help each other, all right? It's not a museum uh, or a mausoleum uh, where statues, plaster casts of, of, of saints are up on display. You don't have to be perfect to be here. Uh, or you wouldn't have this preacher standing in, in front of you, you see? Uh, uh, Safe people need to be together. Safe people need to be together. We need to be together with other believers. We need to pray together. Uh, this is all part of fellowship. Uh, matter of fact, fellowship is the greatest asset we have in times of mistreatment. Uh, speaking of, of, uh, of, of communist uh, Romania, uh, years later, uh, as I was there after the revolution, uh, in the early 90s, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, a pastor told me uh, one time, he said, in some ways I wish the persecution was back. He said, because I can't get people to come back to church anymore. You see? Uh, and he said, especially on uh, Sunday night when they have uh, a TV show uh, something new around here. It's called Dallas. The reruns of Dallas. They wouldn't come back on Sunday night. And I felt like saying to him, I wasn't pastoring at the time, but I felt like saying to him, man, I understand exactly what you have. That's why we can have 90 people Sunday morning and 30 people Sunday night. And I'm glad for the, the 30 people. Where are the other 60? Uh, gun smoke. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you all are watching. I don't know. You may be watching gun smoke. I don't know. I don't know. But the Bible is clear, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but extorting or uh, exhorting or encouraging one another, even the more as you see the day approaching. The closer we get to Christ's return, the more we need to be together. Well, I see the time. Let me give you one more. I got time for one more. I know you do. Let me give you one more. We'll close with this. Resolve to be victorious you got to resolve to be victorious. People that persevere, persevere on to victory. People that quit are out of the game. What's the old saying? Uh, Winners never quit and quitters never win. It's the same idea in life to be victorious. Use the situation that you're in this morning as an opportunity to grow rather than a reason to to quit, right? to go into doubt and despair. I don't think you will because you're here this morning. But maybe you're on the edge. Maybe you're thinking about chucking it all in. Don't do that. Look, look, it's always too soon to quit. But it's never too late 
to get started in the Christian life. It's, it's too soon to quit. It's too soon to quit. Keep up the faith. Remember the fact that we are gold in the making. Job 23 says, When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as Gold, gold in the making, gold nuggets being refined in the forge of the master, ready to be extracted when the master can see his image reflected in the ore. I read an illustration one time that said people uh, in Bible times uh, would, would look, would put ore into the smelt, all right, the smelter, uh, and the goldsmith would know, as they looked in there, if they could see their image reflected in the melting ore, they knew it was time for that to come out. And it was purified when they could see their reflection in it. Now, it's obvious what, what the implications are, isn't it, for, for the Christian. We get out when we start acting like Jesus, you see. Until then, the pressure is on. Warren Wiersbe said this. Uh, he said, we must be confident that, that God's hand is on the thermostat and his eye is on the thermometer. In other words, God knows how hot it is in your situation. And he knows how long you've been there. And when his purposes are complete, you shall come forth as gold. Trust him. Have confidence in that. <clears throat> if you want to be victorious. There's a song that written back in the 1700s that we still sing because it's so true. How firm a foundation. Part of that song goes like this. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. 1 Peter 1.7 says that the trial of our faith being such more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not over till Jesus comes for us. Amen. And then it's glory forever. Amen. It's too soon to quit. Move on to victory. Practice some of these principles that we've mentioned. They're all biblical, and they've all been used by other victorious Christians as well. If you keep this perspective, that it will revolutionize the way you respond to mistreatment. Swindoll, in his commentary on John the Baptist, wrote this, We are all on a journey, growing, stretching, progressing. Invariably, we will meet with mistreatment. But, Rather than fear it, let us profit from its valuable lessons so that one day God will greet us with, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. We're not looking to the end of the conflict because the conflict will never end on this earth. Or looking for the return of the Savior that will end every conflict that you'll ever have, and you'll never have conflict again. Can you make it to the end? Maybe you're here today and say, oh, preacher, this is, uh, I've tried all these principles. Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever repented?